If you have a Bible, Mark chapter 7, we pick up our verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Mark. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 23. Before we do that, let me just pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Ask that you would speak to our hearts again and again through it, that we'd recognize, Lord, the importance of it and the power of it. And, and just, Lord, help us to hear what you would have to say to each of us individually and corporately here today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, probably close to 19 years of age when I came to Christ, it was a, it was a great sense for me of arrival. It was like like coming home in some ways. There was, a, there was a new freedom from guilt, a new freedom from shame. And this battle that seemed to be going on between me and uh, the Lord had, had finally, uh, well, it, it had come to an end. And I felt free, I felt forgiven. And I had, I had moved uh, back into my mom's home. I had uh, dropped out of high school when I was 16 and was traveling with my older brother, doing a lot of surf trips and things like that. So I was in and out of the house. So I, I told my mom I, I wanted to finish high school, that I would go, actually go back to a physical building and finish high school. And so I moved into her home as a young Christian and uh, readjusted to that. My mom had this front room in her house that was kind of like a, a living room, a little kind of had a blue couch in it, I remember, and I would get up late at night. I'll never forget this. As a new Christian, I'd get up late at night after everyone had gone to sleep, and I'd go in that front room, and that's where I would pray. That's where I'd open the Bible, even though I didn't know anything about the Bible, and I could, couldn't seem to get enough of it. Reading the Bible, spending time with the Lord, started going to church every time the door was open, Wednesday Bible studies. It was, it was, a, it was a very uh, amazing time in my life just to suddenly be free of all the other things that would bombard me and now focused on the Lord, focused on the Scripture. And life in Christ was very new. It was very exciting. And I, I remember that this was a, a, a big growth time for me. And, and as I was going to church and as I was doing this at night, I'd get up late and no one knew about it but me and the Lord. I, I, I was at church one Sunday and I met a guy who asked me a question. He said, hey, John, uh, are you memorizing scripture? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you know, thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. I go, oh. He goes, and you know, study to show thyself. And so he's, he's rattling off all these verses he had memorized. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. And I'm like, wow. He says, yeah, you, you need to memorize scripture, John. And so he gave me this pack of cards on how to memorize scripture. So I thought, Okay. So I got the cards. I'm working on it. And still getting up late at night, praying, trying to memorize. And it wasn't long after that that another person introduced me, came up to me and said, hey, how's your prayer life? I go, oh, I think it's pretty good. I, I get up late at night and I kind of told him what I did. He goes, no, 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 that's all wrong. Goes, all wrong? He goes, yeah, there, there, there's a... There's a model for prayer that you need to use. I said, I've not heard about that. He goes, yeah, it's A-C-T-S. I said, A-C-T-S? He goes, yeah, you, first is adoration. You, you come before the Lord. You, you adore him. You praise him. You, and then, then there's confession. A-C, okay, you confess all the sins. And then you begin to thank him for all he's done. And then finally the S is then you pray for your needs. That's supplication. So I said, okay, A-C-T-S. So, so now I've got memorization cards, and I've got A-C-T-S. And 
I had a problem with ACTS because I was a new Christian. The adoration part wasn't hard, but the confession part, I, I was still struggling with a lot of things. I, I struggled with my thought life. I, I, I once in a while, I'd smoke a cigarette. I, I, I would get angry. And so by the time I got through, I would never get through confession to get to Thanksgiving and supplication. I get stuck there. So, so it just, this ACTS was a hard thing for me. And then next thing I know, I'm confronted by a guy who wants me to disciple somebody, at least one person, John, a month. I'm like, really? So, so you can see what's happening. Now I've got the cards. I've got the ACTS. I've got to disciple somebody with this plan that this guy gave me. And then another guy wanted me to at least share my testimony in evangelism uh, once a week. So now I'm avoiding people at church. <laughs> There's the memory guy over there. I haven't looked at the cards all week. Not to mention the guy that wanted me to fast all the time. And I'm usually hiding out at Whataburger or something like that. <laughs> So pretty soon my relationship with the Lord was based on performance, what I could do, not what the Lord had done. And the whole thing began to shift, it began to change. It, it was sort of who I was, not who he was. Now, now I want you to please understand there's nothing wrong with the memorization, there's nothing wrong with prayer, there's certainly nothing wrong with evangelism or discipleship or fasting but my relationship now was no longer a get to it seemed like a have to I have to do all this stuff and in our text today in, in Mark chapter 7 Jesus and his men are met with some that have all these rules on how to connect with God how to do it the, the right way look, look at chapter 7 verse 1 the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found some fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash this way, and there are many other things which they have received and hold, the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, couches. And then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, speaking to Jesus, why do your disciples not walk, or, or we could use the word live, according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, just before this occurs in, in chapter 6, we, we have this amazing uh, story about the calming of the sea and Jesus walking on water. And it says they crossed over and came to the land of Gennesaret, anchored out there and came out of the boat. And people recognized him from all around. They through the surrounding region to begin to carry up people who were sick on beds. He entered into villages and cities of the country. They laid sick in the marketplace. They begged him that he might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. The, the popularity of Jesus is huge right now. And from Jerusalem, the, the religious headquarters, here they come, the Pharisees and the scribes, not to follow Jesus, but really to oppose Jesus his notoriety and popularity is out of control, and they're going to expose him. They're going to challenge him. And so they, they, they see their, these disciples who are eating with unwashed hands. Now, let me first say this, that the ancient rite of hand washing originated with God's instructions for the priests to wash their hands and their feet before entering the tabernacle. It, it was a symbol for them that clean hands and clean feet represent a clean heart without which no one can come into God's 
presence. So, so they would wash their hands, wash their feet, saying, okay, here I come. This is symbolic of the fact that, God, I'm coming to you with uh, uh, my hands are clean. I've not done anything evil. My, my feet have not gone anywhere. They shouldn't go. So they would, they, they would use this as a symbol of holiness to come into the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 30. This is where this, for, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in water when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire. They shall wash with water lest they die. So this was a serious thing for them back then. So over time, th this rite, this ritual of the priest hand washing now had extended to all people in the Jewish faith. So, so what was happening was there was a pressure. This was a, a thing you had to do. But there was a precise way you had to do it. The, the, they had created a, a ritual about it and extended to all the people. You had to place your hands, palms up, cupped a certain way. You, you, you would wash them this way, and then water was poured over them. Then you had to turn them over, and with a fist you'd clean this one, and a fist you'd clean that one. And it was, it was more being ceremonially clean, understand that, than it was being hygienically clean. They weren't that, that much concerned about dirt, and, and, and as much as they were, you did this the precise way. And so they say to Jesus, your disciples are not keeping this tradition. They are unclean before God. That's what they're saying. Now, now, nothing wrong with tradition, nothing wrong with symbols. But here it seems that the spirit of the law is replaced with a ritual that confuses clean hands with a clean heart. That, that's the deal. And so Jesus responds to their accusation. And here's what he says in verse 6. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he quotes Isaiah uh, chapter 29, verse 13. And what he's saying is, hey, Isaiah prophesied about you guys. And he calls them hypocrites. And, and you lay aside, he says in verse 8, the commandment of God, you hold the tradition over men. So you lay aside God's commandment and you put traditions before it. The washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do, he said to them. All too well you reject the commandment of God, verse 9, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you will no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You make the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Now, I'm going to wash my hand. No, I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> no one talks to the Pharisees like this. When you saw a Pharisee or a scribe, the, 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 the response to them was, Rabbi. The response to them was, Learned one, teacher. The, the response to one of them was master. What does Jesus say? Hypocrite. The, their blood pressure just went really high, these guys. And they're breathing very deeply. And, and, and he says, you guys are hypocrites, and, and you reject God's commands for traditions. And he gives them an example. He says, you guys have heard of Moses, right? And the Ten Commandments. He says, how about number five? Remember that one about the mother and the father? 
Honor your mother and your father. That meant more than just listening or being respectful. There was no social security in that day. There, there was no retirement homes. When you were young, your parents took care of you. When you were teenagers, they put up with you and still took care of you. And sometimes even when you're older than that, they still took care of you. They changed your diaper. They took care of you when you had a fever, when you had a skin knee. Now when the parents were old in age, part of honoring in that culture in that time was caring for them. Physically and, and, and socially and, and making sure they, they, they had a place to sleep and, and, and food to eat. But the scribes and Pharisees had come up with this tradition that money you would probably use to support your, your mother or your father could be, well, it could be labeled Corbin, and that meant it was dedicated to God. And that eventually one day the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests would get that money when you passed away. And Jesus says, you have used tradition to disobey God's word. Instead of people helping their mother and their father, you have created a, a tradition by which that's been blocked. And you're accusing us of breaking some oral tradition about ritually washing our hands. And you're destroying God's word. That's what he says to them. And, he, and because of that, he says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. And, and in verse 5, he uses the word tradition. In verse 8, he uses the word tradition. In verse 9, he uses the word tradition. In verse 13, he uses the word tradition. And he uses that word over and over and over again. And in verses 8, 9, and 13, he uses the word of God or the command of God as well. So Jesus is purposely, listen, contrasting religion and tradition with God's word. He, he, he's showing the, the difference between the two and, and how they are putting it, their religious traditions, before the truth of God's word. Now, we, we all like traditions. But Jesus is saying they're using it like a mask, like a cloak to cover their sin. A hypocrite is one who wears a mask to pretend to be something or someone they are not. And, and so in our passage, he said, all too well, verse 9, you reject the commandment of God, the word of God, that you may keep your tradition. So you're using this tradition because you're hypocrites to hide the fact of who you really are. The, the word reject here in verse 9, carries the tense of you continually do it. It's ongoing. You replace scripture, the word of God, with rituals, tradition, and you continually do this. In, in verse 7, he says you, you teach the doctrine of men. In verse 8, he says you hold on to your traditions. In verse 9, he says you keep your traditions. And verse 13, he says, you hand down your traditions instead of the word of God. He says, it's hypocrisy. Now, we have all kinds of traditions in all kinds of church circles. There's traditional, in some churches, membership rules. Certain things you can and can't do. So, some churches... They would not exist without an organ. I remember the first time I went to a Calvary Chapel and they had drums and guitars. I went, can you do this? Is this real church? So, some have to have choirs or they don't feel like they have a church. Or, or, or I've talked to people before says, you know, I just don't feel like I've been to church unless there's stained glass windows. Or candles. Or robes. You know, we had a, a lady in our church once who lived across the street from Lynn and I, her and her husband, and long story short, they had, uh, she, she died of cancer. But before she died, Lynn and I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord, and she had grown up in the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church had 
had done some difficult stuff to her because she had remarried and uh, she, she did not get married in the Catholic Church. And so I did her memorial service and a lot of her family came and they, they were from uh, Chicago or somewhere, I can't remember right now. And she had a big Catholic family. Her sisters came and I shared how she came to Christ and how her life had changed before she passed away. And um, she would sit in our backyard a lot of time and just talk to Lynn and I. And so the family, the sisters who knew the Lord invited me to come and be a part of a big Catholic service that they were having, I think it was in Chicago. And I, I, I said, sure, I, I will come. And so I went and the church was huge. And I don't know if you've ever been to a Catholic funeral. They, they wave incense. They come up and down the, the, with the coffin and they, they've got incense. And everyone, has, all the priests have robes on. And I was sitting up on the platform and the priest was sitting over here and I was sitting over here. And he came to me and said, would, would you like a robe? I go, I'm good. L unless you want me to wear a robe. He goes, no, no, you're fine. And then he came over to me just before I was to come up and share how Patty came to the Lord. He said, uh, would you please do one thing for me? I go, sure, yeah, anything. He goes, before you go up to the pulpit, would you turn and kind of kneel and cross yourself facing the cross? I said, yeah, I, I love the cross. I have no problem with the cross. The problem I had was I didn't know how this worked. What, do you start over here, up here, or down here? And, and so I, I, I did it. And, and I'm not against that kind of stuff. But I, I, I've never seen this in the Bible. Have you seen that in the Bible? I'm not opposed to it, but it's tradition, it's ritual. I'm not opposed to robes. I have a robe at home. It's kind of a... <laughs> it's terry cloth. Lynn bought it, I didn't. I'm not opposed to robes. In fact, funny story, when we, we, we first had our church in the school, we had about eight people get saved, and they wanted to be baptized. It was the middle of the winter. So I called the First Baptist Church in uh, Gulf Breeze. I said, hey, uh, I know you guys have a baptistry. I went to a Baptist seminary. Uh, would it be possible for us to use your baptistry to baptize some people? And he said, well, let me get back to you. I got to check with the board. I thought, okay. So he called me back, he goes, yeah, yeah, you can use it. This is the time, and you know, da, 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 da. So we all showed up, and there was about maybe 30 of us there, and the eight who were getting baptized, and me, and I had a guy who led some worship while we were in the back. So I went back there to go out into the baptistry. It was kind of up high like this, and it was a little pool. And uh, right before I was going to walk out, this guy stopped me. He was uh, one of the leaders of the church. He said, uh, 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 just a moment. I go, what? He goes, uh, you have to wear a robe to baptize in, in this church. I go, really? And these waders. So I put on these big waders, and I put on a robe. And he said, and all the people getting baptized have to wear a robe. I went, wow. Okay, whatever. And so when I walked out, no one was expecting me in a robe. So I had on shorts and a probably a surfing t-shirt, and I walked out in a robe, and they all started laughing. <laughs> I said, where do you see these guys? They all got <laughs> robes on, too. And, and, and nothing wrong with that, but, but it's, I don't think it, it made any difference in their baptism. It, it was tradition. It, it, it was ritual. And there's all kinds of stuff like that. And this was happening to Jesus. These guys had these rituals that they had created. They weren't, they, they weren't required in, 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 in the Word of God for, for His disciples to wash their hands in a certain way before they ate. But it had become so ingrained in the, the Jewish faith that, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were trying to expose Jesus and His men as not being holy, as not being 
obedient. I remember one time when we finally built our first building, uh, we were going to have a dedication service, and we decided to do the dedication service at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. That would be our Sunday service. Because I wanted the architect to be there, and some of the other people said they could, would come, but they had conflicts with their own. I said, well, what if we changed our service to just 2 o'clock? Because I wanted some of the people who had been involved in the construction of it. It was a big deal to me. And so, so we announced it and everything, and everybody was, this one lady that was really mad. I was standing at the door saying, you know, hi and bye. And this lady came up to me, and she, she put her finger, like, right in my face. She goes, I will be somewhere at a service next Sunday at 11 a.m. Well, praise God. I mean, <laughs> I thought, is this some kind of thing that church has to be at 11 a.m. on a Sunday? It was in her mind. And, and it's like you can get so trapped in these different things that, that what Jesus was saying, don't, don't put your traditions, and don't put your rituals be, before this. See if they're in there. Nothing wrong with them. No, you know, Jesus listens. He answers. And he accuses them. And then look what he says in verse 14. He called all the multitude to himself. And th there was a big one. And, and, and here he said, hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things which defile. Here, here's what he says. Okay, gather around. I want everybody to hear this, Jesus says. I'm going to share the difference between truth and tradition, but between God's word and, and rituals. And so he says, it's not these outward acts. There's nothing that enters a man from the outside that defiles him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And then he goes on to say this. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, let me just stop here and say this, lest there's any misunderstanding of what I'm saying and what the scriptures say. We're talking in context here about eating with unwashed hands. Don't misunderstand. Don't, don't go away from the message and say, well, Pastor John said, anything you take into your body from the outside doesn't defile, defile you. We're, we're talking about washing hands. You're not, well, I guess I can smoke pot. Doesn't defile me. I guess I can get wasted on alcohol. Doesn't defile me. I, I guess I can watch anything I want to watch. It's coming from the outside. Drunkenness, sorcery, pharmacia. No, he is saying eating without the ritualistic hand washing ceremony is not where defilement comes. It's not straightening out the performance. The problem is inside the heart is what he's saying. He goes on. When he had entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. They pulled him aside and said, Lord, can you run that past us again, this, this whole defilement thing? Well, what are you talking about? And I think they're very concerned because these guys, they're leaders they're the Pharisees. They're the scribes. They're from the home office. And, and Jesus has just really made them angry. He's really embarrassed them in front of a giant crowd. And Jesus says to them, are, are you without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? It took them a long time to get this. If you remember, even in the book of Acts, Peter still didn't get this. He was, uh, he was at a Simon Tanner's house. You remember he had that vision and the, there was a, a, a sheet let down with all these unclean animals. And three times the Lord said, Peter, rise and eat. Peter, rise and eat. And every time Peter said, no, Lord, I, I will not eat anything that's unclean. And the Lord had to say to Peter, what I have cleansed, don't you call unclean. It took them forever to get this whole concept. They were so caught in tradition. And 
In verse 18, are you without understanding? Because it does not enter the heart, but it enters his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So what Jesus is saying is you can eat pork, brisket, barbecue, hot dogs, but John, there's sodium and nitrates. He's not talking about the organ of the heart. The heart we're talking about here is the spiritual essence of man. And what Jesus is saying, a hot dog doesn't impact your spiritual life. You eat it, and then he says you eliminate it. You go potty. That's Jesus, not me. Jesus is saying this. That's his words. No amount of washing or cleansing hands can change your heart. That's what he's saying. No amount of tradition or ritual. He says, what comes out of a man, verse 20, that's what defiles a man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye, which is anger, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. You can't wash that away on your hands is what he's saying. It's an inward problem. It's, it's, a, it's a heart problem. And we might say, oh, it's, 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 my, it's, it's my thought life. No, it's a defiled heart that affects your thought life. That's attached to your mind, your heart is. It's, it's connected to your heart. Or, oh, oh it's, it's just a sexual sin. No, oh, it's a heart problem that causes it. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's just stealing. I have a problem with stealing. No, you have a heart problem. You, you, you don't teach kids to steal. They, they steal because they have a heart problem. I had three grandkid kids over at my house yesterday before the big storm came through, and we were talking about some things, and one of them's just, he's, he's, he's five years old, and he told me an outright lie. Was I surprised? No. Because they're all little liars. <laughs> That's their heart. If they want something and they think they can get it by lying, they don't have a problem with that. That's who they are. That's who we are. Wanting what other people have. Well, that's greed or pride, my status. It's heart issues. So here we're listening to Jesus saying this. See, see we come to church. We, we have our traditions. Three or four songs. Greet our friends. Maybe once in a while see a video that's funny. Maybe, maybe take communion. Have some encouraging worship. No, nothing wrong with that. But our real need is to hear God's truth about our hearts. That's our real need. I mean, I, I love coming to church and talking to people, doing communion, singing songs and worshiping, and, and that, that's great. But our real need is that our hearts be cleansed and changed by the love of Jesus Christ and the power of God's word. I mean, if a church is just checking a box and having, you know, a cool coffee house or, or whatever it might be. See, I remember those early days in my mom's front room, late at night reading the Bible. Boy, how it convicted me, how it challenged me, how it encouraged me, how it changed me, how it called me at times to repent. And, and I fell in love with Jesus and the Bible. I know this may sound kind of simple coming from a pastor, but, but here it is. Read the Bible and let the Bible read you. That's what Jesus, see, see, I have a Bible here and, and, and I try to read it. It's the Holy Bible. It says it right here in the front of it, the Holy Bible. And this Holy Bible will speak to you over and over again. 
D don't just become an autopilot traditional uh, Christian. Well, where's my Bible? It's Sunday. I got to find it. It's around here somewhere. And go through the, emo the, the motions of church and, and size everyone else based on your understanding of their performance. We can become pretty comfortable with churchianity and stop growing in Christ and his word. And we can have the mask on just like these guys. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. That's what Jesus is saying. And he says, so, so don't put your, your traditions and your, 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 your robe and your mask on uh, and, and, and tell me that that's more important than allowing the word of God to penetrate my heart. Because what Jesus is saying, here's the word and here's your tradition. Here's what the word says, but here's what your tradition says. And so we as well need to let his word speak to our heart to change us. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For, for man looks at the outward appearance. But here's the scary thing, isn't it? The Lord looks at the heart. That's what he's looking at. He, he's not saying, Whoa, that guy's got his hands up pretty high. Now, that may be an expression of the heart, or it could just be what I do. What's in our heart? Je well, Jesus pretty much nails it. He says, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, anger, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Evil thoughts. Now, I wouldn't think anyone out here would have an evil thought. Or a sexually immoral thought. Or theft. Or want to kill your husband or wife. Or adultery, which is mentally or physically. Or greed, desire for more beyond what is affordable, or exploiting someone else, or evil actions which are deliberate, or deceit, or on and on we go. Those things that can be challenged in our hearts by God's word. L listen to this passage. I'll just read it to you from the book of Psalm. The law of the Lord is perfect. Speaking of scripture, converting the soul. The, the testimony of the Lord is sure. It'll, it'll make wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. And they rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. And it'll enlighten your eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More desired are they than, than gold. Than all the things we want. The much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. See, we're liars not because we lie. Because we're born that way. With a heart. We steal not because we've stolen, but because we're born that way with a heart. But here's the wonderful thing. You can be born again. That's what scripture teaches. You can have a new heart through Jesus Christ. Je Jesus confronts this, this, this situation here in Mark chapter 7. And, and, he, and he puts and pits, if you will, tradition and legalism and rules that are trying to mask sin. And he says, no, let's stick to the truth of God's word. Because what you're doing is you're putting your, your, your self-righteousness that, that, that has to do with washing your hands and cloaking yourself with tradition and ritual 
instead of obeying what God's Word really says. And here's the problem with you and I. We can find ourselves doing that in certain ways too, that, that we, we come and we do this church thing and we do all kinds of gymnastics and I do this and I do this and I do this, but do we do obey this? That's the question. Or do we let it speak to us? Have we gotten away from it and say, well, I go to church now and I just listen to messages. It's, it's, it's the problem is a heart problem. And, and the only way that the heart gets really impacted and changed is by allowing God's word to penetrate it and to continue to give us that kind of wisdom and guidance and, and direction. And I love the fact that when you're born again, and I remember when it first happened to me and there in my mother's front room reading the Bible and praying and crying and thinking, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then next thing I know, I'm hiding from a guy because I don't have my cards and I haven't fasted. And, and, and I thought, wait a minute, this is all changing. And, and I don't ever want to get say there's anything wrong with any of those things. Nothing wrong with washing hands. Nothing wrong with rituals. Nothing wrong with robes. No, nothing wrong with this. But if I place that before a genuine relationship and an understanding and the impact of God's Word, then I've placed ritual and religion before a relationship. And I don't, I don't ever want to go there. I don't want it to be a have to. I want it to be a get to thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I remember when my wife, my wife and I kind of grew up together. We got married right out of Bible college and off to seminary, came back, planted a church, been doing it for a long time. And one of the things we said to each other over and over again, you know what? I don't want to ever just do church work. I want it to be about Jesus. And I, that's, that's my heart. I, I want it to be about Jesus for me, for my wife, for my kids, for my little sinning grandkids, <laughs> and, and for us. I want church to be about Jesus, don't you? Amen. I want it to be about God's Word. I don't want it to be a, a performance. I, I don't want it to be rituals. Uh, it, 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 I want it, and you want it, and we want it to be about the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart.